be or not to be and I am. If you haven't already watched my video on the meaning of this speech, please do so. There I'm putting forward the idea that Hamlet's famous to be or not to be soliloquy is all about the ethics and morality of taking revenge and not about suicide at all. And I'll be reading it here from that point of view. But however you understand Hamlet's soliloquy, one thing is clear. Hamlet is discussing options here and he's doing it in a very clear either-or way. To be or not to be. There's a choice. Whether it is nobler to suffer the slings and arrows or to take arms against the sea of troubles. And this is where we come up against a problem. To create that sense of balance, of either-or, we need to read the lines in a certain way. Now. Everyone knows that Shakespeare wrote in iambic pentameter, right? Well, like a lot of the things we think we know, that needs a bit of fine-tuning. Nero didn't fiddle while Rome burned, Marie Antoinette never said let them eat cake, and Shakespeare... well, maybe it's pushing it a bit to say he didn't write in iambic pentameters at all, but he never used that term himself, and it was not used about his works until long after he was dead and buried. Yes, many of his lines have ten syllables, and sometimes they do read fairly naturally as iams, if music be the food of love play on. Did dum did dum did dum did dum did dum weak strong five times. But a lot of the time they don't fit naturally into that pattern, and as the actor Mort Patterson says, writing in the Shakespeare Bulletin, reading them like that actually makes it harder to understand what Shakespeare is saying. Patterson is not alone. Stanley Leith's said much the same thing in a book published in 1935. D.W. Hardy said it in 1971, Oliver Morgan says it in The Cambridge Companion to Shakespeare's Language, and so on. But like a lot of other myths surrounding Shakespeare, the idea that Shakespeare wrote in iambic pentameters is still firmly implanted in people's minds. So what would be a better way to understand it? Morgan proposes scanning Shakespeare's blank verse with three marks. Instead of just weak, strong, he adds a third mark, a hyphen, to indicate a syllable about which there is some uncertainty. So, to get back, finally, to Hamlet's soliloquy, rather than to be or not to be, we have to be or not to be. That second B would not normally carry a stress in everyday speech, so there's some doubt about whether we should stress it in Hamlet's soliloquy. That changes things a lot. Instead of saying there are five stressed syllables in each line of blank verse, we're basically saying there are up to five. Another way of putting it is that we mainly stress the content words, the words that carry the meaning of the text, while the function words, the words that hold the sentence together grammatically, are generally unstressed. And as a general rule, if we force a stress onto words that would normally be unstressed, we end up making it harder to understand. Anyway, that's enough of theory. I'm going to read Hamlet's soliloquy now in the light of all that theory. What it comes down to is that almost every line has only four stresses, which, as I say, seems to match the balanced either-or content of Hamlet's words here, with just a couple of lines in the middle carrying only three stresses and a couple of lines near the end with five. OK, here goes. To be or not to be? That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them. 
to die. To sleep. No more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished to die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. And there's the rub, for in that sleep of death what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietus make with a pair bodkin? Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country, from whose born no traveller returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience doth make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought, and enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. How was that? Was it hard to follow? Easy to follow? My feeling is that it's much easier to understand Shakespeare if we read his blank verse with a more natural stress pattern, instead of trying to force it into a strict de dum de dum de dum de dum de dum pattern. Anyway, you try it and let me know what you think. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, turn on notifications, and if you want and are able to give practical support, join as a channel member.